Friends Podcast. All right, here we are once again. It is Monday, August the 19th, and I am here with this is Clyde JKL. I remember this time saying my name, girls. I am here with Diane Hunt and Constant Bronson, and this is uh, August 19th, 2019, our episode 10 of our Artist Friends podcast. Hello, Diane. Hello, Constance. Hi, everyone. This is Diane Hunt. How are you? Hi, everyone. This is Constance Bronson. All right. Let's get started. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about the videos. There's more entertainment, the recommended videos. Uh, her. This this week was a uh, funny video about. I know I'm going to mess his name up. Diane, how do you say that artist's name? It's Marcel. Marcel Duchamp. There we go. Marcel Marcel <laughs> Duchamp. Duchamp. <laughs> <laughs> Duchamp. <laughs> Duchamp. And there was a funny video where a lady was saying, "You know what the heck is going on with modern art?" You know, and she blamed it on Marcel. And then I found a, an old interview 1956 a black and white interview on youtube of, of uh, marcel right that guy was he was a bit of a wacko <laughs> but i just thought we would uh, we kind of light you know lighthearted, and it got me to thinking about you know growing as an artist and one of the points he made out made it so, but yes uh you can blame him on our current, you know, state of the art world, our modern art, and anything goes. But on the other hand, that's kind of a good thing because it gives you inspiration. It gives you uh, thought provoking uh, ideals and that your art isn't that bad after all. <laughs> so well, it gives you the freedom to try different things not necessarily you know what you think the um institutions or whatever think is the way things are done it gave you the freedom to try other things instead right and that so we've got to thank him for that at least you know <laughs> i think some yeah. yeah, it's not so taboo <laughs> to try other new things <laughs> yeah, i'm not going to yeah. get, get started on oh some of the stuff crazy stuff that's up there now you know uh uh, what a uh, uh, dead shark in a tank, you know. <laughs> there used to be so many hard and fast rules about what was art was supposed to be and the rules and regulations about how things were supposed to be done. And what he, what he and a lot of the artists did were bust open the, 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 um, art world and what was okay to be free about how you could paint what you could paint and and what media you could do use and mixing it the media and the subject matter and what just everything went you know if you wanted to throw a mattress up against the wall and splash the crap all over it you could <laughs> what as a french was french say vive la vita you know okay <laughs> you know, liberated, you know, the, the uh, art world. So let me start the share up because we're going to listen to a few clips from one of my favorite uh, art instructors, uh, Steve Houston. And he, uh, in growing as an artist, he, uh, he actually kind of uh, emphasizes uh, some of that, but it gives more, more of a structure for us. So to you, like, what is the purpose of creating art? Is it like, is it enough to just create beautiful pictures or do we have to have a message or record the there's modern no, time? There's nothing or... in this world you have to do. Okay. So... And, and in some ways, nothing you should do. I mean, if you're going to try and make a message, you're probably going to close the door. 
and the people you speak to won't be the people you really want to speak to because it'll mm. be oversimplified, it'll be patronizing. So probably you don't want to, but there's all sorts of exceptions to that. I mean, look at uh, Goya's war uh, etchings, look at mm. Katie Kovitz's wood blocks. You know, they're proselytizing about the horrors of regimes and war and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it works beautifully, but most of us, it comes off as cliche. Right. And especially in a, a you know, the, though even that far back, it was slower times. Now things move so quickly, we get bored. It's about the wood blocks and the um, etchings. Well, when he's talking about you know the you know purpose of, purpose of creating that uh, when he it really resonated with me when he said uh, the open door don't especially in representational art. Um, you know, you, you, you want it to look like something that people can recognize, but not necessarily, uh, you may want to put some kind of a meaning. Well, why did he paint that apple? Like I may paint an apple, but maybe with a bite out of the apple or, or like in the case, like what I like to care about show, he painted this beautiful still life before he got into his, it got commissioned for religious paintings, but he added an extra twist. They weren't your normal still lives. They were fruit with uh, blemishes on them, and uh, the leaves looked like insects had had bit you know through them, and, and that that opened the door because then people would look at that and they would you know have to. Well, what was he trying to say? <laughs> Come on, people, you got to talk. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of the creativity is not necessarily um, depicting something that you see like a photograph would do. Like you're putting feelings and um, emotion into it and depicting that as well as what you're seeing. So it's, or feeling like, and in, in like abstract, it's not, um, it's more your feelings and, and stuff, not the emotion, not, um, something that you physically see. Yeah, when I paint an apple, it's not really about the apple. It's about the color. It's about, it's not about the apple. He talks really, he says that when he says, you know, keep the door open, you know, type thing. If somebody comes up to you and they say something about your piece of artwork that is completely different than what your intentions was. He said, don't shut him down. Be happy. He said, you know, reply, hey, you know, I never thought of that. Thank you. Said, if you have that happen to you enough, you know, times, you're on to something. Your creativity has reached, has crossed another threshold. You, you know, because, because <laughs> The idea that your work of art can in, can uh, inspire an emotion in somebody, that's as artists, that's what, that's what you want to do, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it transcends in other people. It means that they took the time to look at your painting long enough to see something else in it other than what you were seeing, which is a good thing. Right. Um, when I, a lot of times I, I used to do a lot of paintings with cl a lot of clouds in them, and I'd still like to do paintings with a lot of clouds in them. I haven't done them lately, but that was one of the reasons I did the ones with a lot of clouds in them, because I wanted people to look at the clouds in them. And a lot of times I wouldn't see things in those clouds that other people would see in the clouds, you know? I had one painting that had a poodle in the clouds and I didn't even see the poodle until somebody else pointed it out. <laughs> and by golly, there was a big poodle in the clouds. So I named it Poodle Clouds. <laughs> I, had, I had one of my watercolors. I did a watercolor of, from a photograph of a um, olive tree because olive trees, I, they are so, have so much character but they, they grow for hundreds of years. I mean, they have to—they have to be almost 50 years old before they even produce olives. 
Wow. As a result, those trees, they, they, they look just like the kinds of trees that you see in the old horror movies or like in the, like in the Wizard of Oz, the haunted forest. You know, they're all ragged and, and squirreled wow. around. Well, I used this photograph. I found the internet of this, of this olive tree that I painted. And when I got it completely done, I saw there was a face. There was a face of a child. When you turn it on the side, you can see the face of the child and it's smiling at you. <laughs> I looked at the cool. photograph and I didn't see it in the photograph until I moved, turned the photograph on the side. Then, okay, it was there all along. I just painted it exactly as I, you know, as I saw it. I was trying to, to get the character uh, of the of the tree, you know, the the, old, the roughness and the, the texture, you know, and as a result, m my work, I brought out more of that child's face than what was in the actual photograph, which... That's cool stuff. Really kind of weird, you know, it's kind of cool, kind of freaky, but... <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next clip. When he talks a little bit about uniqueness, I think that carries this uh, this conversation a little bit further. I hope you guys can hear this. And romantic light and only four color palette. Uh -huh. And so what do you do when you look at those? You Nobody goes up there and says, what the hell does that mean? Those have nothing to do with each other. They go, now let me figure out what that means. Right. Do you think it meant something to him, or was of he... course it did? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's none of our business what that is. Okay. So, and he could, he's happy to tell us. But I mean, what's more important is when you do that, all of a sudden you've opened the door, and now the audience can come into your art. But if you give them every little thing, if you come in and give them every petal right. on the, on that bush, what's left for them to do? Hmm. But if at least you just do the three dots then they get the pleasure of connecting those dots. And what happens then when you, when you leave things open-ended like that, where you don't, when you don't tell a story, but suggest a concept, or put together things that shouldn't go together. Magic in boarding schools, that's stupid. That's not real. That's childish, but it's kind right. of cool. I wish there was. Well, I yeah. think it's the execution, though. You can put it together. It's all of that, really yeah. Way, Any right? of these, yeah, that's always the danger. You can always do yeah. it badly. And sometimes people do it badly, and then somebody else takes the idea, and they see past the style. And they say, that was a great idea. It was just really bad. Mm. So, And you see that as a, okay. just for in Impressionism, French Impressionism. For a lot of artists and a lot of audience, they'll say, that's lousy drawing, not graceful brush strokes. Okay. So but that boy, case, it's beautiful color. So why don't I take? Why don't I steal the color palettes uh -huh. and the the beautiful shifts of warm and cool and rich and gray, limiting the value range into that sunlight sunset range of values, and then I'll put that on a sergeant. That's what sergeant did with these watercolors, and I'll use the skill set of a, of uh, of a Velasquez. I'll use the color palette of a Monet. Mm -hmm. Now I've mashed up again. I've taken the best comments well I, I have to agree with them about not giving all the information in your painting and letting the um, viewer fill in because um, everybody will interpret it, things a little bit differently and it kind of um, gets them more involved in the process like and and they can finish the painting however their vision is like you know, what they what they feel about it is. They, you can't do that with paintings that like um, photorealism type things. Yeah, every think, detail is there, and there's nothing. There's less for the viewer why, to do. Yeah, I think that's why I like impressionism so much because there is um, there are varying degrees of finished <laughs> finishness to an impressionistic painting that you can do. And it leaves a lot to the viewer to finish, you know. Um, it's very painterly. And that's what I like about Impressionism. It's so painterly. And like you say, with realism, it's like a photograph that's been painted. And I know that a lot of people love that. But to me, it's just not painterly. Yeah, I, I don't want to jump on it. I mean, I I appreciate those people that are very talented for photorealism, but uh, I never really strive for that. 
one thing that uh, years ago, a long time ago, well, when I was living over in, over in Italy, and of course I got a chance to see a lot of the old masters work. You know, it's everywhere. You know, it's in a museum, public buildings. You know, and you always run across. And when I would uh, stand up close and get as close as as what would be allowed if there wasn't a barrier or a rope. I mean, a lot of times I was stepping over the rope, you know, and I would see the brush strokes, and there would be real painterly type, you know, and I said, oh my God, he didn't even finish his, his this connection here, you know, and it looked like he's, you know, got other colors coming underneath, and then I step back and, oh, you know, it all comes together. The closer you get, the more it falls apart, and the further mm -hmm. away you get, the more it comes and together. That always, you know, I that unless always. it's photorealism, and then the photorealism, it just looks like a photograph, no matter how far away you get or how close you get. Exactly. And there is a following for that, you know, there really is, but like there's a following for every kind of art. I mean, there is a following for every kind of art. It's just what you, what is your niche? You know, you have to find your niche and that's what you paint which or do. Your, which, you, know. you know, Steve talks about your uniqueness. You know, you right. Find, you know, find your and you have to, and that's what you develop. You, that's part of being an artist. You develop your uniqueness and that's what makes you get, have your I, brightness. I, I, I frequently talk about Caravaggio. He's, you know, one of my favorite. I don't want to paint exactly like him, but I've studied his techniques. I've watched a lot of video, YouTube videos, there, and I'm able to apply some of his techniques. Well, that's also one thing he was just talking about, too, is he talked about Sargent was, he took part of Monet, and he took, who was the other artist that he took from? He took part. He took Monet's palette and and somebody else's. The impressionist color. Yeah, the impressionist colors. Yeah, like. And he Cole. took another guy's. Malibu, who was Malibu. the other artist that he took? Yeah, Malakwez. I think it's a, about to say. Yeah, that. and he took yeah. his. Yeah. He had these two artists that he liked, and he married the his style together and made his own style. You know, and and. You know, so it's really easy to get distracted. We live right. in fairly pampered times, not everybody certainly, but uh, even our poor people aren't as poor as they used to be. Mm. You know, in some places they are. Yeah. But I mean, we've got, we have uh, leisure and we have conveniences. We have Sundays off at least. We don't have to work 12 hours a day, at least some of us don't. Mm -hmm. So uh, all those things create opportunities. There's nothing you have to do. It's you, trust your instincts and your instincts will get better with it. Trust your imagination and your imagination will get better. They're muscles, so work them. And at first you're gonna make bad choices in terms of great art, probably. And maybe you end up never doing great art, but you sure have fun doing it. And, the, and that small group of friends and family absolutely love it. And grandma or whoever, or your boss, uh, absolutely adores that uh, that little portrait you did, or that big portrait you did of him or her. So you can you can manage your expectations, and you can be patient with yourself. You know, so oftentimes we get really hard on ourselves as artists because we're we're creative and we know what it should be maybe, and it's not coming out that way, and then we we give up. It's just too painful. There is. Uh, I forget the writer, but he said it was uh, like Norman Mailer, some, some 20th century famous writer. And he said, with every book I write, a little piece of me dies. That was how painful his creative process is. That was how hard he was on himself. Mm -hmm. And think of all the great artists who killed themselves, you know, the Hemingways and the, and all, you know, the Van Goghs and all this kind of stuff. The tortured creative mind is a cliche even, you know, okay. because we, do, we beat ourselves up. So being patient, uh, giving yourself time to, to get there and being, uh, um, being comforted with the idea that you're not as bad as you think you are. And you'll probably never do a masterpiece, but that's okay. You put out the best you can. You know, I was waiting, waiting, waiting to put out work in galleries. And finally, Dan McCaw said, you're never going to do a masterpiece. So why wait? Just do the best you can. Right. And my view now is if I'm not embarrassed by my work three or four years later, there's something wrong. That's true. I should be better. Right. 
So, but if you wait to be the best, you'll never get there. You'll never put out one painting. I mean, you can frame these things in whatever ways, use yeah. whatever words make sense to you. Mm -hmm. But what you're trying to do is uh, do something that, that rings true to you. Is there a, something you tell students that have a hard time figuring out what rings true to them or what they should do? Yeah, you know, I mean, there's, again, there's nothing you have to do. So you can do, like I love, uh, since I grew up with comic books, I love all the comic book movies come out. None of those are masterpieces. Some are pretty good, but none of them are great films by any means. Most of them are fairly bad films, but they're sure fun. They're entertaining. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Just uh, just doing a beautiful sunset or a be beautiful figure on a couch, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's a lot that's right with that. So it doesn't have to change the world. And the fact is, I can almost guarantee you whatever you do won't change the world. But it might change a little piece, it might change one person. And that person might go out of the gallery or, or from the folio feeling a little different or just being grateful that they had a break from their troubles. So it's a, you manage your expectations and you decide what your definition of an artist is, what, you, what do you really want to be. And what your, when it rings true, what is that truth? Well, the thing is that when you're, especially when you're starting out painting or in any kind of art form or anything really, you can't expect yourself to be an expert right off the bat. <laughs> you know, it, it takes practice. It takes time to develop, to, you know, hone the skills that you need no matter what it is, like it could be, yeah. you know, learning how to plumb, do plumbing or, and it, you know, anything like you have, you can't, you're not an expert right from the start. Right. And a lot of people think art is like easy and it looks like so much fun and um, relaxing and stuff. And it's really not all that, uh, it, it's hard work. You know, it's, it's a lot harder than most people think it is. And, it turns your shoulders into knots if you don't watch it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, people think that you're born knowing how to do everything and you're going to draw everything perfectly right from, you know, from the time you're born or something. There's like some inane talent that you've, I mean, some people are a little more talented. I, you know, you have to say that, but I don't, I don't know that it's something that you're really born with or if it's just a, um, a passion that you have that you uh, drive yourself to be to perfect your craft and it takes time to do that it's not something like I mean I've been drawn since I was you know little and I used to copy things and copy things and copy things <laughs> I mean hours and hours and you know years probably of just copying stuff that I saw and you know I still don't I still have to practice. Like it's not something that, right? You just do automatically. Just that urge to create all the time. I think is mm -hmm. is the way I think about it. It's just an urge to create all the time. You know, to draw all the time, to paint all the time, to make things all the time. I mean, it doesn't go away. You know, ever. And you're st and you're constantly striving to get better. Like you're never satisfied, really. You're you're always trying to be better than you were, you know. Or you're challenging yourself to do something you don't, you didn't think you could do. You're it's constantly you're constantly doing that. Well, that's like you know? a, a little bit of advice that Stephen Bauman in one of his videos said. Uh, every time you work on a piece of artwork. Um, put as much into it like you were being paid a million dollars for it is practice for the next one. Mm -hmm. And when you have that frame of mind or you have that attitude, you see yourself improving because you remember, well, the last pain I did this didn't work out so well. I'm not going to do that this time. I'm going to try something a little bit different. Before we end this episode of uh, August the 19th, 2019, episode 10 of Artist Friends Podcast, let's ask if any of us have any major announcements. Constant, 
you got any shows or anything coming up you want to announce? I do have a show coming up in October from the 18th to the 20th in Oklahoma City, the Affair of the Heart show that I've been doing now. This is going to be, what, the second year? So that's going to be, I've got to get ready for that. Boom. <laughs> you're gonna have, and you're going to uh, be having your jewelry, right? Your, your, yes, uh, I'm going to be showing jewelry. Right? And I did sign up to bring some art pieces in case I have room to push some in. So I'm trying to work on the schematics of getting some of that into the booth. So we'll see if I can make that happen. So if any listeners are in the Oklahoma City area, drop in and say hi to Constance. Push. Keep an eye yes. on her. She'll be posting more uh, her booth number and more information about that. More yes. And how to get tickets and things you know, for that. Diane, yeah. you, got anything, you got anything special coming up here? No, I haven't. I've t- kind of taken this year off from showing. Um, so I haven't really um, got anything like that going on. <laughs> All right. All right. And, of course, i got, you know, these two are grinning because they knew what I was going to announce. Um, I'm an emerging artist, and I'm a self-taught artist. And I've never had a actual <laughs> gallery exhibition. Well, I'm going to have one for the entire month of October. And of all places, it's going to be in, in Zurich, Switzerland. And this is true to my uh, 21st century uh, mentality. Uh, one of my images has been sent to them. And the gallery, it's a physical brick-and-mortar gallery. They will have 55-inch uh, screens, monitors, throughout the gallery. And my work will appear on one of those monitors. Other artists around the world. So any of the listeners are over in uh, Zurich, Switzerland, Stop in the gallery. It's called the it's called it's called the Art Box Gallery. I'm not even going to begin to say the name, the address. <laughs> Call it Swiss, you know, whatever <laughs> the, the language. But uh, of course, I'll be posting more information about that as it gets closer to October. All right. Thank you to everyone for listening to this episode, episode ten of our Artist Friends podcast. And goodbye to everyone. Bye-bye, Costas. Bye-bye, Diane. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> All right, and we will see everybody next time. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Brostan and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronzan at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you'd like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkl at sign mystery-otr.com. That's cjkl at sign mystery-otr.com. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons License 2019. Thank you for listening.